Well, it's like they say, everything is getting more connected these days. Remember when people would still get excited about this thing? That's my town. What's making it all tick? What's welding it into a going community? Many things, of course. But one of the most essential factors in its growth is communications. Communications provided by the telephone company. Today we have the telephone on steroids. And information can flow like water through these electronic veins. This makes the world a much flatter place, a much flatter place where people from all over the world can easily work with each other. Today we're going to talk about how technical innovations flow through social networks in high-tech ecosystems. When we think about technical innovation clusters, we typically think about Silicon Valley. But there's a new kid on the startup block, Israel, the Holy Land. In their 2009 book, Dan Siener and Saul Singer have coined the term startup nation to describe this emerging tech ecosystem in Israel. Last year, Wired Magazine even produced a documentary on Startup Nation showing how the Holy Land, Tel Aviv, and the military unit A200 are coding their way towards a really prolific tech ecosystem. I truly believe we live in a unique time in history from a technological perspective. Today I'm joined by Professor Neil Gandal from Tel Aviv University. Thank you for having me, first of all. We will talk about his recent working paper, Network Mediated Knowledge Spillovers in ICT slash Information Security, which is joint work with Lee Brandstetter from Carnegie Mellon and Nadev Kunievsky from the University of Chicago. In his paper, he looks at the close innovation and knowledge networks that exist between the Holy Land or Startup Nation and the US um, with Silicon Valley and Boston's Route 128 in particular. We will learn a lot about the economics of networks, Startup Nation, and we'll even run a little bit of R code. So stay tuned. I personally caught the network bug a few years ago when I started working on, on network data of Silicon Valley VC investments. So whenever I meet someone who's also into networks, I get so excited. And so naturally, my first question to Neil was how did he get into networks? So let's just say that for the last 10 years, I've doing a, been doing a lot of research on the economics of network. And indeed, even longer than that, um, I remember when I was doing my PhD, and back then there were only telecommunication networks, and uh, I was working on networks, and people said, why are you working on networks? There aren't any networks, you know, except for the telephone. Now I'm really dating myself. Okay, maybe there was the fax machine too. And I said, well, there's just really a lot of interesting questions, and people said, well, you know, it's just going to be so esoteric then. You're going to be in a little niche space. I said, well, it's very interesting to me. Well, as we all know, it didn't turn out to be a niche space. There were lots and lots of networks. And at the beginning, it was hard to do things uh, because the computers weren't able to, you know, calculate uh, important like centrality properties of big networks. So, you know, at the beginning, you're thinking about doing some research into something that doesn't exist. And also, you're, you don't, can't get the data. But then everything came together. And uh, I started working on a paper on open source software in probably about 2007. And there we did similar things to this paper. In other words, we were interested in measuring knowledge spillovers. Well, knowledge spillovers go through networks, okay? They go through people. And open source seemed like a really good place to start because in open source projects, we happen to know everything about the project, uh, the ones that are like hosted on SourceForge or GitHub. We happen to know, for example, how many people work on the project, who those people are. And so since we know who they are, and for example, if you work on several projects, then um, we know those projects are linked because you can take maybe the source code or something else between projects and we can construct the network. We were, you know, we defined a network to be such that two open source projects were connected if they had a contributor in common because that's probably how, you know, the spillover went through. Obviously it goes through people, it doesn't just go through the air. And, um, and so 
I mean, this this results came research came out very nicely, and uh, and then one day I was talking with someone about you know Israeli high tech, and everyone was talking about this one book called um, Startup Nation, which maybe you've seen, maybe you've not. Um, you know, it's it's a cute book and it has some interesting stories, but then I began to wonder, you know, we've never actually tried to test this, this urban myth to see whether there are indeed spillovers in which everyone talks about, you know, spillovers in, you know, in the Israeli networks that seems to make a difference. Um, and so I realized, well, I can almost use the same methodology that we had from the other paper. Of course, there were some other difficulties that we'll probably get to, but so that's, that's sort of how we got there. So let's dive into the paper. And obviously, since this is an empirical paper, my first question was, what kind of data are we actually dealing with? Here? So the data are going to be patents, okay? And we're going to be able to get all the data about all the patents because the US uh, PTO, US Patent and Trade Office, has a wonderful database, which is, which is easily accessible. And so we're able to get all that data and we're able to know who works on the patents because Sorry about that. Okay, just take a sip of coffee. We are able to get, we know who works on the patents because the inventors are listed. We know where the inventors live. And so we basically have, in this case, we basically have all the data that we need. I mean, it's actually not all the data. We like to have other data, but it's in a first cut, we have the data that we need okay, to do that. So basically, we're dealing with patent data here. And to easily demonstrate that the empirical identification strategy, let's create a small dummy data set consisting of five patents and six inventors. So let's start out by looking at an actual patent. So here we've got an Apple patent and you can see you have the patent number here, then you have a list of inventors, then you have a description, and then you have some patent citations which we will use later. So basically all we're doing right now is plotting into our Excel or CSV file um, the, the patent name and define whether it's a patent or whether it's the inventor. And as I said, we'll take a list of five patents and six inventors. So the way that Neil has constructed the innovation network is through patent data. But obviously what he's trying to identify are knowledge spillovers, but knowledge is spread through social networks. And while the USPTO is a great source of data, it might not be the best source to identify these knowledge spillovers. So I asked Neil whether he has looked at other data sources. You know, there's a lot of things about the innovators that we're not using because we don't know um, from the patent data. But in theory, we could go get their resumes off of LinkedIn, which, we're, which we were trying to do until it became very difficult to do that, to get thousands and thousands of uh, resumes off of LinkedIn. But in theory, we could actually find out about um, where people lived, where they went to school, other sorts of interactions they, they had with each other besides working together in a patent, and maybe we could, we could tease out the ideas. Since we're dealing with networks here, the next question I obviously had was, what are the nodes of the networks, and what are the edges of the networks? Okay, so a basic thing is, what does the network look like? And you know, what, uh, what are the nodes, how, how are, the nodes connected to each other. So let's think about a very simple case when you have five or six patents and you might have five or six innovators. Okay, so you would say that two patents are connected if they have an, innovated, an innovator in common. For example, if I worked on patents one and two, okay, they have an, they have an innovator in common, that's me. Okay, so that pat, those patents would be connected. And you can put the joint network together. I mean, what you can do is you can go put in the network with the patents and the individual. So you have different kinds of nodes and you can show that, you know, just put a patent and then show that I'm working on this patent and then someone else is, you know, working on this patent. You can, you, can, you can basically build this joint network. And then what you can do is you can, you can split it just into the patent network. You could say, okay, I just want to look at the patents. I know these two patents are connected if they have an innovator in common. I don't have to show the innovator in the middle. I just know they're connected. And then I build the patent network. The interesting thing is I can also build the innovator network, you know, because two innovators are connected if they work on, you know, okay, if they work on a patent with each other, okay, so then I can also, I can also build that network. In the first network, the patent network, the nodes would be the patents, and in the second network, the innovator network, the nodes would be the people. 
now that we know what the nodes and the edges are in our network, let's boot up our R Studio and try to reconstruct the networks that Neil is talking about. The goal is to recreate these three networks, which Neil has put as examples in his paper. We've already defined the vertices before, and I've added two further columns. One is the color column, which we'll use to color the nodes in the network, and another one is a quality index, which we'll get to later. At the moment, it's just a random generated number, which I put in for the, for the patterns. Then the next step is to define the edges, and all I did here was basically to take the data from Neil's paper and just plot them into a CSV file here. And the next step then is to boot up our R Studio. And the first thing we have to do is we have to require iGraph, which is the package we'll use to graph our network. And I've saved a specific layout which looks very similar to the one that Neil has used in his paper. And I've already saved that into a vector here. And then the next step is to basically load the edges and the vertices. And I've done this here. You can see these are the nodes. These are the edges. Then we create the network, and then we can basically start plotting it. So this is a very basic plot here of this um, bipartite network to show you that these are not just random bubbles, but that these are actually our nodes. I have put in a legend here, and I've reduced the size a little bit. And you can see that we have Thomas here and pattern three here, which is basically this relationship. And then to give you a little bit of intuition, I can define the degree centrality here and save this into the vertex vector. And you can see the degree here, uh, which is now defined for every node. And then I can basically define the vertex size to re reflect the vertex degree. And you can see now that when I plot this, that basically the most connected um, nodes are larger in size, uh, reflecting their higher de degree centrality. So we basically have this first network, and the next step is to get from this bipartite network to, uh, to a network of only inventors and of only patents, respectively. And then what you can do is you can, you can split it just into the patent network. You can say, okay, I just want to look at the patents. I know these two patents are connected if they have an innovator in common. I don't have to show the innovator in the middle. I just know they're connected. And then I build the patent network. The interesting thing is I can also build the innovator network. And what we have to do for this is, is a transformation known as bipartite projection. By using the bipartite projection, I can load in just the innovator network and just the patent network. You can see now we have basically just the patents here or just the inventors here and then we can plot this. And so basically this gives us the network with just patterns and with just the inventors, so these two networks. So constructing networks is all nice and fun, but at the end of the day, what are we really trying to show here? In other words, what effect are we trying to identify and what's the empirical identification strategy to get there? Okay, so we have a very simple theoretical model. We have a very, very simple theoretical model that says if there are such spillovers and if, they, and if the spillovers decay in a, in a certain way, then it should be such that the success, um, or it should be that certain network centrality measures like closeness, okay, will be associated with success. So our theoretical model leads us to the econometric analysis we do. And then at, at some stage, it's, then you're just running straightforward regressions. So basically what he's saying is that he's trying to relate a quality measure of the patent to a measure of the patent's positioning within the network. So if we load up our R Studio again, I can show you what's going on. So the last step here is to basically start using a quality index for each patent. I told you before that I just put in a random number here. Neil is actually using patent citations, so he would he would be using this kind of data to estimate the quality index. All that I have to do is basically um, do a simple linear re regression, which is what this LM command is doing. What you can see here, if I do the summary, is that 
this isn't significant. Basically, when I regress the degree on the quality, you don't get a significant result, which isn't unexpected because I just used random generated quality measures. But in Neil's paper, of course, this is different and he gets highly significant results. So this sounds all easy and simple. Just a small R command and we've got our regression results. We're all happy, but not so fast. You remember when I put in the random number for the patent quality? Well, it turns out you can't just use a random number to measure patent quality. So what does Neil actually use? So what will be a measure of success? Generally, you think of citations, just like academic, uh, academics, you know, the measure of their success in some senses is citations. Of course, there's other things, but citations is a reasonably accepted measure for success. See. Since Neil is using forward citations as a measure of patent quality, things are getting a little bit more complicated. Basically, forward citations are a network measure from another network, namely citation networks. And this gives rise to a certain kind of endogeneity problem, which is very common in network economics. In other words, we have to ask ourselves, is the patent's position in the innovator's network affecting the patent's quality aka its position in the citation network, or is it the other way around? This is what is known as reverse causality. And obviously I asked Neil how he's addressing this endogeneity concern in his paper. There is one big catch, and it relates to what you just talked about, the identification strategy. At first, when we looked at this, we were, um, you know, we were looking at the network at the end of time. We we're looking at the network at the end of the time, but then we think about it, you know, a patent that came out in 2007 didn't benefit from the knowledge, you know, of a patent that came out in the future. So we realized we had to construct the network for each patent at the time it was applied for. Okay. So in other words, you freeze that point in time, you look at all the patents that are out and, and see where that patent sits in, its, in the network space. And that's the network it has available to it. And that was a big headache for the RAs because we have thousands of patents. It means calculating these measures thousands and thousands of times instead of once. But that really solves the problem because we, you know, we now we've essentially solved the endogeneity problem of feedback because we're taking the network at the right point in time for each patent. Now to policy implications. I asked Neil what his paper teaches us about Startup Nation and what other countries can learn from the Israeli example. I think, you know, that it's, um, first of all, you have, to have a, you have to have a nice place. And of course, what does it mean to have a nice place? But you mentioned the Silicon Valley, which, you know, has pretty good weather. And in addition to maybe having nice, uh, appealing aspects, there's also excellent universities in the area. I think that's really important. But, you know, you might ask yourself, why is the high tech concentrated, say, in Israel? It's not everywhere, but it's concentrated, say, in Tel Aviv or the, in, the, in the surrounding suburbs. And it's less in, in other places in Israel. And you might say that it's, well, you know, it's, it's like an agglomeration effect. You know, there's, there's not going to be, you know, this probably when a high tech firm is thinking of locating, it's going to locate in an area where, you know, as, you know, highly talented people live. OK, once more high tech firms um, begin to locate there, more talented people want to live there and vice versa. And how does it all get started? Well, it gets started by, you know, probably by the great universities. But this is all speculation. So that's it for today. I hope you found it useful. I'll put links to all the materials in the show notes below. And if you want to learn more about law and economics, why don't you show me some love and hit the subscribe button below. 